As long as you keep trying, you will not ruin your kids. Welcome back to the Open Ed Podcast. I'm Ella Richmond, your sometimes host, and today I have on Sandy Grant. How are you today, Sandy? Doing great. So Sandy has six kids. She began homeschool in 2004, so she's been doing this for a very, very long time. She's a, a veteran in this. Five of your kids are done with homeschool, and now you just have one more, correct? Yes. He's 16, and he's a junior this year, so... That's awesome. And you're very, very involved in the homeschool world. You have a guide that is absolutely incredible for new homeschool parents that I know you share liberally. You're very embedded inside of just different Facebook groups and different um, different communities. What what has that journey been like for you, getting started in homeschool and then like over time getting as deep as you are now? We originally started homeschooling when um, my number three child was approaching kindergarten age and he already knew pretty much everything he needed to know yeah. during kindergarten and so I kind of started thinking about maybe homeschooling him and then my husband suggested that we might also homeschool the older two who were in approaching second and fourth grade we decided to pull them all out at that point, and I just fell in love with homeschooling, and I loved it. The community was a lot smaller back then. There were a lot less resources, and we were pretty much on our own, but we found you know, some small groups to get us going and some, a good support group. And one of the things I really appreciated was those who had done it, who were willing to willing to share their ideas with me and how what worked for them. As I moved along, uh, I started doing more homeschool support options, and I found I was answering the same questions over and over again, and so I did make a, a document that I, I share to kind of answer all the, the, the beginning questions and things that work, things that don't, and hopefully whatever tips I can give that are helpful. Oh, yeah. That document is incredible. Um, if you're okay with it, I would totally love to link it below and just kind yes, of share it with... you're welcome with, to. Thank you. To share it with all of our audience because I was reading through it and it, it goes through everything from the curriculums that you've tried to the different resources that have been helpful in your, your family to the way that you structure your learning. So when you got started, you mentioned that homeschool was obviously such a different thing than it is today. The There were far fewer resources, far fewer communities. What was that like for you? And watching all of this unfold, how has that been over time? I guess it was a giant leap in that I, I we one, we were on a very limited budget. I think our budget was $50 for all three kids total. And so we were buying inexpensive workbooks or looking for things at the DI or the thrift stores and stuff, just looking for inexpensive resources that I could cover all the subjects. One of the things I did start with was I started with what I was familiar with and trying to replicate public schools where we would start with math and do that for an hour, a half hour and then move on to language arts. And, and I had that structure laid out and we had a little school room down in the basement where we all sat and, and everybody had a desk to sit at and I quickly found that that was not working. I had a baby that would need diaper changes or I'd have to go to nurse and I'd miss math, you know, for the day or I'd send the kids out to recess and my sister would call and, you know, it's been weeks since I talked to her, so I'd want to talk to her. And so I talked to her and realized that we skipped three subjects. And so I found that... um what really worked better was having a, a checklist of, okay, this is what we want to get done during the day. We want to do math. We want to, I want an opportunity to read with the kids or we need to do spelling and just whatever I wanted each child to accomplish. I can kind of show a whole picture of a chart. There's a couple of them. Um, I found that by making charts and just listing what we needed to do, our day was more natural and fluid. And if things were going, if I was busy with the baby, 
then I could have them do something that they could do on their own. You know, if they had a computer program that they used, I said, well, go do your reader rabbit and then I'll get back to you when I'm done with the baby. And it made it a lot easier having a lot, lot of kids to work around to be able to make sure I got everything done and we didn't like let everything go. It was more more functional and doable than trying to stick on a, a schedule. Yeah, how did se. you figure out what was going to go on those checklists to begin with? What like what was guiding you in that? Mostly, I kind of look at each subject and what I want to include, and and for the most part, I like for language arts, I break it down so it's not like it just says do your language arts on the chart. It'll say, okay, we're going to do read with mom at, every day. And I want you to do your spelling every day. And I want you to read for 30 minutes or, you know, for a younger kid, maybe 15 minutes on your own. And so I would say, okay, there's language arts. And then I would, same with math. I would say, okay, I want you to do a lesson of math and I want you to work on your math facts. So those two things would be on the chart. And then, you know, science and history and just the basic things that you would want to include in your day. And each year I kind of evaluate, okay, what do I want to focus on and what do I want on their charts? And then I try to keep it down to like about 10 things on their chart, some of them that they can do on their own for when I am not available to help them. And so it's kind of a you learn as you go, and many years I'll make a chart, and three weeks in, and I will say, oh, this is not working. We have way too much to do, or this curriculum is not something that they're gonna, that's going to work for this kid. So I'll go and re revamp their chart a few weeks in, and that's, that's fine. Or even halfway through the year, you know, if you find, okay, we are using this curriculum for math, and it's just not working, it's perfectly fine to switch things up and change as needed. So. Oh my gosh, yeah. How do you know, th I've, I've heard this from so many parents, but how do you know when a curriculum won't work for a certain kid? Like, how do you know the difference between, okay, this is just challenging for them and, hey, this is really not going to work? That takes a lot of intuition and gut feeling sometimes because I know I, I know I have a lot of kids who just won't do it because they don't like it and it's not because it's too hard it's not because it's too easy it's just they're being stubborn you kind of have to say okay is are they just being stubborn and even if that is the case okay is this a fight that I'm worth fighting that's worth fighting you know right now I'm dealing with my son with writing I was trying to bare bones it and make it as easy as possible for him and I said okay I want you to write for 15 five minutes every day. I don't care what you write. And that was just one little thing on his, on his chart. I want you to write for five minutes. And here's a Google Doc. I want you to use this Google Doc and I'll just make sure you wrote something every day. And he has fought me on that so much. And so I'm in the process of trying to evaluate, okay, is this worth fighting? because he won't do any of his other school because this one task is so overwhelming for him? Or do we look at a different option to cover the material or to to something else to focus on for language arts this year, you know? And so it's just kind of a lot of trial and error, and you just have to be willing to recognize that that's part of the the game plan, and that's just kind of something that you will have to address is is trial and error and trying to figure out, okay, what works, what doesn't work, and what am I willing to fight with, and what can I say, you know what, this really is not worth what I'm getting out of it, you know, because sometimes, you know, if it's just busy work anyway, and they don't want to do the busy work, then there's no point in making them do it, even if it looked fun to me. Why are you not enjoying it, you know? I think sometimes we think it would be a good thing, a good fit for them, and it's not, so. Mm -hmm. I imagine that's also difficult with six different kids, six different, you know, personalities, six different 
passions and and things that they're good at. How has that been for you as, you know, a parent, as the person that's kind of leading them and guiding them in this homeschool journey to figure out the best path for each individual six kid? I think each year I spend a lot, I, I do most of my planning during the summer. Once school starts, I don't have time to make lessons plans a lot. And so I pretty much try to say, okay, this is what we're going to do during the school year. And this is how much I want them to get done each day. And so during the summer, I'll, I'll kind of look at each subject and how each kid can get that subject checked off on their list. So some years we'll do it all together, like for history, some years we will do it as part of our morning routine where we just include history in there. Other years we'll all be covering the same, like doing U.S. history, but I'll have one using a, a textbook, a public school textbook, one just reading a Joy Hakim's story of uh, or history of us books, the 11 volume set, you know, and one of them may be watching Liberty Kits, you know, and so the different kids, you kind of meet them where they are and try and cover the subject. Some years we go really light on history and go heavier on science. And some years we're, we really focus on read out louds and making the most of that experience. And so every year I kind of just say, okay, where do I want our focus to be this year? And it changes every year, you know. One year, all we did for history was during lunch, we watched an episode of American Ride, and that was our history for the year. You just kind of have to say what works for our family this year, and, and it can change as well. So. Is this a lot of trial and error too? So like you're figuring out, okay, this kid might work best with online resources or this kid might really, really enjoy videos or this kid might really enjoy reading. Is it a lot of that and then trying to like slot in what works best for a kid in the subject that works best for them? Yeah, it is. It is. Like one year I was, I had it all planned out. I was going to use story of the world and that's what we were going to do. And I had all the books lined up what read out louds we were going to do and the worksheets were all set and everything. And the first day, the first week of school, I brought out the textbook and my one daughter says, I won't do that. I don't like that textbook. And so I won't do that. And she was not even going to make it possible for me to do it with anybody. She was just being really stubborn about it. And so what I did was I took a step back and said, okay, what can we do to hit this subject without using this textbook that she is so adamant that she will not sit through? And so Story of the World has an activity guide where there's uh, recommended picture books that go along with each chapter. So I just, every week, I just put those picture books on hold and we read the picture books rather than the textbook. And we did it as part of our uh, just bedtime routine, I think. And I just, we just read picture books and they were all about the same subject. So she got all the material, just not using the textbooks. Two years later, she decided she wanted to do story of the world and she wanted to do the textbook. So <laughs> we did end up using the textbook, just not that year. She was being very stubborn and didn't want to even consider it so yeah when when do you fight your kids on those things like when when are you like okay I know you're being stubborn but you know like where we have to do this as opposed to recognizing that maybe let's say because I was talking to somebody else and they were talking about the fact that sometimes your kids are ready to receive information in a certain way and sometimes they're not right? Sometimes yeah. they're ready to learn about math and this complex thing. And sometimes they're not. And if you just wait a little bit more, then the patience that you have will allow you to meet them when they're ready. But like, how do you know as a parent? I mean, I guess this is really hard to, to answer, but like... It's it, it's really hard because you, you're you not only their teacher, you're also their mom and you have to deal with them uh, mm -hmm. all day long. And you can't send them home and make their parents do the homework with them <laughs> or anything. It's it's all on you. And so I tend to probably be 
a little light on, I'm like, this isn't working and it's not worth fighting. For the most part, I, I don't like fighting with my kids. And so if I can, I usually will try and find an alternative that accomplishes the same task. If they're not interested in using that specific curriculum, I will say, okay, well, let's, what we need, we still need to do language arts. I'm not going to let you not do language arts, but these are our options. What option do you want? And giving them a little choice as to, I'm not going to make you use this curriculum if it's going to be a fight, but mm -hmm. you do need to do something. So let's find something that you're willing to do. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I've got some kids who would do it, whatever I asked them to do and felt bad if I was, if they were not doing everything. And then I had other kids who were like, you can try and teach me, mom. Good luck. I don't want to learn, you know? And so each kid is different and, you, and, and sometimes you're, you have to put the relationship before that your desire to have them meet all of your check boxes that you want to have them meet. Mm. That is an interesting note right there. Put your relationship before like your parent relationship parent to child relationship before your teacher to child relationship or the homeschooling relationship i bet a lot of parents feel that where it's like it's like you know you're with your kid all the time in a normal school environment traditional school environment it's the teacher and then the parents at home how do you balance that delicately i don't know that i did a really good job <laughs> honestly I, do, I don't know that it's it's hard. It is hard because you're with your kid and you're tucking in them into bed and in your head you're like, why didn't you do your math today? I'm so frustrated about this because I, I'm trying to make this easy on you and you're trying to make it hard on me and, and yet you want to be able to just leave all that behind and just say, I love you, kid, you know, and no matter what you're doing in school and that we've been fighting all morning about trying to get you to do what's on your checklist, you still want them to know that you love them. And it's, it's really just hard and you just have to keep trying. And that's my number one thing. Just keep trying. And it's not going to look picture perfect. No matter, I mean, maybe there's a picture perfect homeschool family out there, but I haven't met them and it certainly wasn't me. But I have people who think it is. I have people who say, oh, her kids are geniuses. My kids are not geniuses, <laughs> you know, but you just keep trying and you just do your best so that you can know at the end, I did try and they may not be going to college or that may not be their path, but you tried, you did the best you could to provide them with everything they needed and you just do your best. Yeah, I want to touch on that in a little bit. You mentioned earlier that you have, well, three of your kids, two of them are in college, and then one of them is not. And she chose that as her own path. But I want to touch on that in a second. But before I get there, what was the, what was the journey for you to go from homeschooling young kids to homeschooling older kids? Because I think there are a lot of people that also kind of are trying to figure that out too. Because it, it's difficult to go from, you know, young kids where you understand most of the, the material, you know, it's, it's not extremely advanced, it's fun, you know, they're pretty receptive, they might be a little bit like all over the place, but they're usually pretty happy to learn to teenagers where the, the challenges are so different. What was that like for you and all of your kids? I mean, I think it's, it's the same as any aspect of parenting. You go from a baby who's just laying there in the crib to a toddler to a preschooler. I mean, they grow so gradually that you just kind of go from one step. I do know that for me, when I first was delving into high school, you know, with my oldest, it's very, you worry about it because you're like, can I do this? Am I going to ruin my kids? It's a big concern. Am I going to ruin my kids? And from my experience, as long as you keep trying, you will not ruin your kids. No matter what curriculum you're using, no matter what, whether you're an unschooler or an online schooler, whatever you're doing, 
as long as you keep trying, you won't ruin your kids. I do think that we worry probably a lot more than we need to, which is standard for mothering. I think, you know, we worry that our kids aren't potty training in early enough, and we worry whether or not our kids will go to college. We worry. Now that all my, I have three kids who have graduated from college, I worry that they'll be able to live the life that they want to live, you know? And so you do worry, but you just need to know that as long as you keep trying, you'll be okay, and they'll turn out okay. It's, yeah, I like that. Homeschooling high school is not all that much different than the other grades. And one of the joys of homeschooling is they do have, there is homeschool curriculum out there that is designed to be taught by people who don't know anything about the subject, you know? And so I tried to use, if I used a science curriculum for high school, I picked a homeschool one rather than a public school one because those are not designed to be taught at home. And What's so, an example of what they do differently? Primarily, they have it written to the student rather than written as a, it's as a textbook. Um, they kind of assume the student doesn't know anything and, is, and also assume that the student doesn't have anywhere to go for the answer. So they'll include answer keys that the student has access to or the descriptions are written in such a way that the student can help find the answers to the questions. And so they're just designed to be used by people who are not experts in the subject. So That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's super helpful. I bet a lot of homeschool parents, either if they're just getting started, they probably hopefully are learning something there because I didn't know that there was a difference between those two. So that's that's really cool. Yeah. I took calculus but I certainly couldn't solve the, the problems that my kids have to solve in their calculus workbook or their assignments. I couldn't do that at this point. It's been 30 years since I was in school. So yeah, you get the solutions manuals that are provided by the curriculum and, and the answer keys. And you just kind of, and part of it is you learn alongside your kids as well. Have you enjoyed that? I have. I much prefer the younger set. I will say teenagers stress me out a little bit. But one of the things I really loved is I didn't use a reading curriculum for most of my kids. Most of them, I just we just went to the library and got readers. And I pointed to the words and they read along with me and they learned to read that way. But it wasn't working for my youngest. And so I actually got a reading curriculum for him that was designed for dyslexic kids and I was amazed that I'm like, I never knew that, you know, the rules about the soft C's and the soft G G's, you know, I, I, I had no idea. It was great for me to be able to learn all these new things that, you know, I've been reading for 40 years, but I didn't ever know that that's why that letter made that sound at that point, you know, and so I, I, I love learning and so. It's been fun to be able to learn the things that I'm able to learn alongside my kids. So. I found that that's definitely a common thread in a lot of homeschool parents is just the love of learning. And, and, and I kind of miss it because in teenagers, they do so much on their own. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I kind of want to do that with you. But at the same time, they do need a little bit of autonomy and they don't like doing everything with mom. So, <laughs> but mm -hmm. yeah. So back to the, the conversation about your kids and college. So one of the things that Isaac, our CEO at Open Ed, is pretty big on is the idea that not everybody needs to go to college and that there are so many options outside in the world. There are trades. There are some very specific types of jobs that you can get into without college. And then there's a set of jobs that you can't get into unless you go to college. What was yeah. that experience like for you? Were you already pretty open to the idea of no college or was that something that you became more okay with as you started to you know, reflect on your child and the things that they needed? It's kind of hard because I grew up, my, me and my sister were, our, were the first college graduates wow. in my family. And so for me, that was the end goal is to get a college education because I saw that not having a college education limited 
some of my family, you know, they, they couldn't do certain things. And uh, even my, my brother went to work and he was working, but he got to a certain point where he couldn't advance without a degree. And so for me, that college degree was important. Also, I wanted my kids to be able to, when they moved out of the home, to be surrounded by a group of peers who were doing something with their lives. You know, I didn't want them getting an apartment some somewhere and hanging out with a bunch of kids who were just playing video games all day or working at Pizza Hut as a delivery boy. You know, I wanted them to be associating with people who were trying to better their lives. And I felt yeah. like college was the best place for them to do that. For the most part, that was always my goal. And and honestly, that's probably where I, I would like them to go. But I don't I don't honestly think that that degree is always necessary or even beneficial. My oldest graduated in our education, and it's quite a useless degree because there's no full-time positions in our education. There's a whole bunch of part-time positions, but she's, you know, she's found a really, it's really hard to find a job. And so unless there's a, a job at the end of that four-year degree that's a marketable job, we paid four years for the experience, not mm -hmm. for the job that she got at the end, you know. Whereas my son, he graduated in computer programming and came out earning a big, huge paycheck, you know. And so it kind of depends on what their major is, and you have to be wise and help them to be wise in choosing the direction that they're going, especially if they're going to need to have a solid income. Now, my, old, my oldest still pays her bills, and she's had a job. It just hasn't been in her field. That so. makes sense. Kind of along the same lines, one of the things that you mentioned in your guide, which, again, everybody should check out, was the idea of self-led interests and how, as a, as a homeschool family, it's really important to leave time, not just for the curriculum and the subjects that you have to do and check the boxes on, but also for the self-led interests that your ch children might have. Can you talk to me a little bit about that and kind of how you've helped your kids develop their self-led interests over time? I think my key is I just try to keep everything that has to do with our homeschool, you know, when we're going to get our school done type of stuff. I try to keep that pretty simple and I make sure want to make sure that they're well, they've got a broad base for everything they need to learn so that they, you know, can understand the basic timeline of history and the basic concepts of biology and physics and stuff like that. But I don't want to fill up their whole day with things that they have to do for me and leave no time for them to have things that they're interested in. And so I try to keep it down to, you know, about four hours worth of school, maybe a little bit more, you know, so that they're done by two or three in the afternoon and and they can have plenty of time to do their own thing. Um, and whether or not they filled that time is kind of more up to them because at that time I'm, I'm like, I got to get dinner done, done and stuff like that. I've moved on. But like my son has, since he was, 10 to 12 has loved computer programming and he was making things on scratch and and that's what he grew up to be is a computer programmer i think that uh it allows them to have that flexibility to to do it and also i think it, it's a good preparation for life because in life you have a lot of free time that you have to fill and if you are constantly being told as a child what you need to do to fill your time then when you're an adult and you have free time and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do with it, you know? And so I think it's important that they have the option to choose how they spend some time of their day. I completely agree with that. I've seen so many people that I know really, really well, friends, family, et cetera, that, you know, grew up with that, that whole like, okay, every single bit of your schedule is filled. You're going to do school in the morning, then you have clubs, then you have all these other things. And then they stop and it's like, you're so used to a certain pace, but then the the question is, okay, well, how am I going to fill my time? And like taking an active role in filling your own time is really, really difficult if you've never been taught how to do that. 
What are some other examples of things that your kids have done to, to fill their time? It kind of just went off their interest. My oldest was a reader. She read a ton. My number two was a baker. She cooked a lot. <laughs> And she she has a food blog where she shares her recipes, and her pantry looks nothing like my pantry. It's a lot more fancy. <laughs> she's she she loves to cook. Number three, he's a programmer. He spends all of his time on the computer, and and that's what he does. Trying to go just go down the list. Number four was mostly social. She was more interested in going and playing with her friends. We would sign her. We signed her up for ballet for a year, and. They wanted to have her take more classes, and she's pretty much, yeah, I'd rather play with my friends. <laughs> so that's, that's, but she's a very social person, and she's very good at, she loves everybody, you know? That's her personality, and she can make friends with anybody. My next son spent a lot of time doing debate with the Wasatch Independent Debate League. He started he actually when he was 11 he said he wanted to do debate you have to be 12 but he turned 12 the week before school started so he was technically old enough <laughs> and so he actually had to talk with the with Sam Martino who's in charge of it and he had to get permission to to join at that young age but he loved it he did it for the full 6 years he um was on the student council, and he uh, was a TA for the beginning and intermediate classes for a couple years. And he actually, his senior year, he decided that they needed to have a prom for his senior year. And so he actually formed committees, and I took him over to the community center, and we rented the building, and he I went as a chaperone. I just, I'm like, I should probably go and and support, just to be supportive of you, I should probably go and see how it's going. And I took him over there and I'm like, where are all the debate staff? You know, where's where are all the people from debate? And he's like, oh no, this is just us. And so all it was just a bunch of teenagers that ran the entire prom and there was no adult. Other The only other adults there were his chaperone person that he was over the chaperones it was all their family his family his aunts and uncles were there and so wow, that's he so was cool. able to do that all by himself and so that's how he is and then finally my youngest is really into minecraft videos and he watches minecraft videos and he makes minecraft videos and he records and he edits and he does all the background stuff and he spends exorbitant amounts of time doing that. <laughs> so. That's so cool that you've given them the opportunity to do that. What was it like balancing, obviously, the at-home aspect, but also the the social aspect, especially having six kids? Were you trying to find things in the beginning that could, I don't know, work for everybody? Or was it, were you open to doing one thing for one kid and another thing for another kid? When I had all six home, it was really hard I, I liked for each of them to have something that they were doing, but like if you're running six kids to something, you run out of days to ru yeah. run the kids. And so for a while there, we were involved in a, in a just a small, relaxed style co-op where they had a group for preschoolers, a great group for girls, group for boys, and a group for the teenagers. And we did that for a couple years so that everybody had their group, but it was all within a two-hour block of our day. I really feel like that was heaven sent for me because it's what I needed at that point because I uh, there was no way I could meet everybody's needs mm -hmm. at that. And after a couple years, the group kind of died. But by then, I had kids graduating and I didn't have as I, uh, my my payload wasn't as heavy. I guess I, I didn't have as much on my hands because I was sending kids off to college and stuff. But for those years, that worked really well to be able to meet all of their social needs. Um, my older kids will tell you that the social was not what they wanted it to be. And it was pretty much because there weren't as many homeschoolers out there. There weren't as many classes available for homeschoolers to take. And we also didn't have the funds 
my older two. My oldest never used uh, my tech high, which is now open ed. My second just did it her senior year. And so there just wasn't as many options for them. Mm -hmm. My younger kids have had a lot more options available to them. My youngest chooses not to partake of them. <laughs> He's perfectly happy <laughs> not doing much socially. And so, but but Zach, the one who did the, the prom, he was very social and had friends all over the place. That I'm like, where did you meet this person? <laughs> you know? And so he just, he had friends all over the place and he went to, I think, three or four different proms his senior year because he was invited oh, wow. to them by all of his friends. And so, yeah, so there's, there's, there's definitely more options available now than there have been in the past. Oh, yeah. And that's exciting. I mean, for, for newer families especially, but also, I mean, I imagine for even you watching how much this landscape has developed, it's pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah. I know when my older two first started being teenagers, we would get, you know, on the homeschool groups and we try to get all the kids together. But you're you're dealing with teenagers and it's not with with a, a six year old. You throw them in a room full of six year olds and I'll, instantaneously they've got, they've got three new best friends. Teenagers, you do the same thing. And it's nine times out of 10, you're going to find nobody that you want to talk to as a teenager, <laughs> you know? And so it, it was a struggle that there were options out there that they were able to do, but finding people who you clicked with is hard as a teenager. And so, yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I, I mean, it was even difficult. I went to traditional school, but th that yeah. was even difficult for me. So yeah. And I was, I was the same social just was not something that happened. And I went to school every day. No. Yeah. I love that. So I'm going to hit you with a couple of rapid fire questions to end out this interview. Okay. It's been so fun so far. <laughs> Excited to hear your thoughts on these next things. So rapid fire question number one, what advice would you have for a new open ed or open education parent at any grade level? Number one, read parent link because <laughs> it answers a lot of your questions and it, there is a large learning curve especially if you're going custom built. There's a lot of things you need to know what's approved, what's not approved, and how to create your schedule and, and stuff. But reading Parent Link can help you do that. Ask other parents who have been there. And that's probably the a big thing is you just don't be afraid to ask questions. Even if people will say, well, have you read Parent Link? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's true. You you should probably read Parent Link first because then it'll cut out a lot of your stupid questions. But really, there's no stupid questions, and so there there will be people who will answer you, even if it is something that you could have found out in Parent Link. <laughs> no, that's so. a good point. Parent Link has a ton of information. Sometimes it's difficult to navigate. Which it's a little it's a little overwhelming. <laughs> oh yeah, but. which we are working on. Um, yeah. So updates to come hopefully in the next little while. But yes, definitely a good a good resource. Um, next rapid fire question: What has been the biggest challenge in your homeschool journey? I would say the balancing between being a mom and being a teacher. Just for me, knowing that the responsibility of their education lies on my shoulders, it's a big daunting responsibility that you're faced with as a homeschool mom. And yet that relationship of being their mom and knowing, letting them know that no matter how they do on their schoolwork, you still love them. It's hard. It's not an easy thing to do. But I'll come back to if you just keep trying, you won't ruin <laughs> your kids. So. Mm -hmm. I love that. Third rapid fire question. Um, what is one story or example of something that has really, really worked for your kid, either like a success that they were able to have because, you know, they have this flexibility and they do homeschool or just something that looking back, you're like, this was really, really cool. One of my favorite moments. Um, I think one of them was I, my one daughter who's not academic. I heard about a, a Shakespeare class that was happening and I'm like, there is no way in this world that she's going to want to do that. That is way too academic for her. But I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll ask her. 
And she actually said yes, that she wanted to take the class. And so I signed her up for the class. And I will say she was not the most stalwart student in the class, but she loved the social aspect of it. And she loved the, the theater aspect of it. And it got her into doing community theater and and she's doing community theater still. So I think it doesn't hurt to ask your kids, even if you don't think it would be something that they would be interested in. Go ahead and ask them if, if you think it's something they would benefit from. Say, what do you think about taking this ballroom dance class? Probably they might say no, <laughs> but you might be surprised as well. Great advice. And the last the last rapid fire question, what do you see being a challenge this n- next year, this coming year, different from this year and the years prior for homeschool families? I know you're really involved. You talk to a lot of them. One of the things I actually miss about homeschooling not being as popular is there was a lot more community where the moms were teaching the classes And so Mm. I, as a mom, would sign my kid up for a class, but I would be helping with that class. And so I'd get to know the moms. One of the hardest things with the advent of funds being put into the system, a lot more parents are just sending their kids to class, but they're not actively participating in that homeschool environment. And so I guess to me, the lack of support and interaction among the homeschool parents and helping each other out and associating with others who are also in your situation, it makes you feel a little bit more isolated as a parent that homeschools because you're not associating with people, with other people. So, you know, the more you can find your tribe or find your group of of people that you can associate with that also homeschool, I think it makes it easier. That's a great point. Well, this has been so amazing, and you've shared so many amazing things. I hope that everybody listening is walking away with a lot of great tips, actionable things, and also just like mindset things, better ways to look at their homeschool journey. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I I hope it was helpful. (laughs) No, it definitely was. And you're very active in all of the Facebooks and also um, basically most homeschool groups, right? Yeah. Primarily the Utah Homeschool Network because I'm an admin there. Well, thank you again so much. This was awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.